Good morning, uh, this is Dr. Saeed Al Nasser, and today we are going to speak about uh, pediatric fracture. Um, we, we need to know the principles of uh, pediatric fracture, uh, the differences between adult bone and uh, pediatric bone, uh, specific facts of fracture in children. Uh, and uh, after that, we will talk about uh, a few uh, factors that can affect uh, the pediatric population. It is important to know the anatomy of the pediatric bone. Uh, as you know, uh, in children, uh, we have growth plates, uh, and that uh, gives us a specific uh, areas in long bones. Uh, we have growth plates uh, near the ends of the bones uh, with uh, epiphyses on the articular side and metaphyses uh, on the other side. Uh, and the mid shaft is called the, uh, the diaphysis. Uh, generally speaking, in infants, uh, fractures affect the diaphysis. Uh, in slightly older children, fractures happen in the metaphyses. And in adolescents, uh, you can get epiphyseal fractures. Uh, this is an important slide showing the differences between uh, children's bones and uh, adults' bones. Um, the most important differences uh, are that uh, the periarticular area in children uh, are usually cartilaginous, uh, and cartilage, as you know, does not show on the X-ray. Uh, so this can be confusing sometimes uh, when it comes to diagnosis. Um, also, the child's bones have thicker periosteum. The periosteum is the outer uh, layer that surrounds long bones. Uh, it provides stability and it also uh, provides the blood supply uh, to the bone. Uh, in children, the periosteum is thicker than adults. Uh, which means that the healing is better because the blood supply is uh, much better in children. Also, this provides some stability uh, when uh, the bone fails. So when you get a fracture, the periosteum uh, remains intact in most cases, uh, and that uh, stabilizes the fracture somehow. Um, uh, also, uh, because of this thick periosteum, fractures are usually simpler in, uh, in children. Uh, as we said earlier, we have growth plates uh, at the ends of the bones, uh, which uh, provide uh, the longitudinal uh, growth uh, mainly, and also some circumferential uh, growth. Um, because there is always remaining growth uh, in the growing child, uh, there is a potential for remodeling. Uh, remodeling means uh, going back to the original shape. Uh, that has an important clinical uh, implication. Uh, if you get a fracture in a child with some angulation, uh, this can be accepted uh, sometimes, uh, and you do not need to reduce uh, the fracture as the remodeling potential uh, present can correct the deformity with growth. Uh, this feature uh, is not uh, there in adults' bones, and the angulation present uh, at the time of the fracture uh, will remain uh, indef uh, indefinitely. Uh, in the child's bones, the ligaments are very strong, and it is very rare to get uh, ligamentous uh, injuries, uh, and it's much more uh, common to get uh, fractures. There are a few characteristics uh, for the patterns of uh, injuries in children. Um, pediatric bones have a tendency to bow rather than break, which uh, does not happen in adult bones. Also, compressive uh, forces can cause what we call a buckle fracture or a torus fracture. Uh, this is a fracture that only affects uh, children. Uh, we will speak about that uh, a little bit later. Another type of uh, fractures that affect uh, only children are green stick fractures. Uh, 
um, this is a common injury um, when you get a, a force applied to a bone uh, the bone or the cortex with its periosteum can break on one side uh, on the other side of the bone uh, the cortex bends that's another break but the periosteum remains intact so that gives pure angulation uh, of the bone uh, this is uh, this relative stability of this green stick fractures are uh, provided by the intact periosteum uh, on the compression side of the fracture also you can get what we call a plastic deformation in children uh, this is uh, a bending of the bone uh, rather a full cortical uh, break so these are the common uh, areas for fractures in children uh, with the distal radius uh, being the most common uh, also you can get uh, ulna humerus and clavicle fractures uh, these are common fractures in children this is a lateral x-ray uh, of the knee area in a child uh, you can see that there is uh, a big uh, uh, radiolucent uh, area between the femur and the tibia uh, this is caused by the big cartilaginous uh, parts at the ends of the bones uh, this is very important in uh, children uh, especially when it comes to diagnosis uh, because that makes diagnosis much more difficult uh, uh, when uh, an injury happens so sometimes you will need to be guided by the clinical picture rather than the x-ray so uh, as we said there are some differences between children's bones and the adults bones uh, in children fractures heal quicker uh, because of the thicker periosteum and the better blood supply uh, that can be an advantage but sometimes uh, if there is an angulation uh, or a deformity uh, the fracture will heal very soon uh, if you don't interfere earlier uh, also as we said earlier again um, there is a great remodeling potential uh, in children so uh, smaller deformities or angulation uh, can be tolerated and the bone will correct itself even if there is some overlap uh, sometimes between the bony ends uh, this will heal nicely uh, and uh, remodeling uh, will uh, correct any deformity so plastic deformation as we said uh, causes bending of the bone rather than uh, a break so you will not see an obvious fracture on the x-ray uh, the most common site for this is the ulna so if a child comes with a history of trauma to the forearm uh, with pain uh, and tenderness particularly over the ulna uh, you will have to suspect uh, this injury um, because it can easily be missed buckle fractures affect uh, children only uh, as we said earlier it is a compressive uh, failure of the bone uh, on one side of the bone uh, it is a stable injury and it heals very quickly uh, any simple cast uh, will uh, do and uh, most of these uh, fractures heal within three weeks this is a buccal fracture of distal radius uh, which is the most common site for these fractures uh, you can see a bulge uh, in the cortex um, as shown by the white arrow uh, and the other side is uh, intact this has uh, a great healing potential and it is a stable fracture This is an example of a green stick fracture uh, you can see uh, on the tension side uh, pointed by the yellow arrow there is a complete uh, break in the cortex and in the periosteum however on the other side uh, the cortex is bent uh, i.e. it is broken but the periosteum is intact uh, providing uh, some stability
uh, for this fracture. Another important uh, topic in uh, pediatrics are uh, growth plate uh, fractures or physial uh, fractures. Uh, these are very common in children uh, as uh, the growth plate is a weak area uh, in the long bones. Um, uh, we will uh, speak uh, about it uh, in the next few slides. Uh, you will need to, to know the anatomy of the growth plate, uh, which will come later uh, in this presentation. Uh, these are the layers of the growth plate, uh, which you will need to know. Um, most injuries happen in the zone of hypertrophy, uh, zone 3, uh, which is generally safe and does not uh, affect the uh, future growth. However, if an injury happen, happens at uh, zones 1 or 2, then this has a potential to affect uh, the growth and in this case uh, you can get uh, uh, premature uh, growth arrest sometimes so fractures uh, around the growth plate uh, are classified according to the sauter harris class classification um, there are five types uh, the most common type is type 2 uh, in type 1, there is a separation between the metaphysis and the epiphysis through the growth plate. Uh, in type 2, uh, there is a separation, but uh, this uh, fracture extends uh, through the metaphysis. Uh, in type 3, the extension uh, extend, uh, or the fracture extends uh, through the epiphysis. Uh, in type 4, the fracture extends through both the metaphysis and the epiphysis and in type 5 uh, there is a complete uh, crush of the growth plate due to compression uh, as i said the most common type is type 2 uh, and uh, the higher the type uh, the poorer the prognosis the prognosis generally speaking uh, all of these types can uh, uh, theoretically uh, affect uh, the growth and cause premature growth arrest. So generally speaking, uh, any child with a Sauter-Harris uh, type fracture will need a longer follow-up to check for this possibility. Uh, on the right-hand uh, picture, you can see a complete separation between the uh, metaphysis of the distal radius and the epiphysis. So this is a type 1 fracture. In type 2, Sauter-Harris uh, fracture. Uh, the fracture goes through the growth plate and then extends into, into the metaphysis uh, and exits uh, proximally on the radius. Uh, so this is type 2, which is the most common type. You can see also the associated ulna fracture. Type 3 fracture which extends through the epiphysis and this is one of the most common sites for this uh, injury uh, which is the distal tibia. Type 4 fracture. Uh, the left hand picture uh, is showing uh, uh, fracture of the uh, proximal phalanx in the finger. Uh, the fracture goes through the epiphysis uh, with and then through the growth plate, and then it goes very slightly through the uh, metaphysis uh, with a small uh, metaphysial fragment. Uh, on the right-hand picture, uh, it is exactly the same fracture, but uh, it is affecting the medial side of the distal tibia. Uh, so the fracture goes uh, through the epiphysis, the growth plate, and then the metaphysis. These fractures have a higher potential for uh, growth uh, arrest uh, and growth problems uh, because the fracture involves all the layers of the growth plate. Type 5 fractures are very difficult to diagnose uh, because they are crush injuries to the growth plate uh, and you do not see a fracture line. Um, it uh, it needs to be guided by the clinical judgment as well. So if there is a history of an injury uh, with pain, swelling, and tenderness around the injured area, uh, 
then you will have to suspect this injury even if you do not see a fracture on the x-ray. Uh, and these injuries have uh, very bad prognosis, uh, so they will need uh, longer follow-up uh, to check for potential growth disturbances. As we said, the diagnosis of fractures in children can be sometimes difficult, so always remember to um, rely on the clinical uh, judgment, history, and examination. Uh, and when you diagnose a growth plate uh, fracture, always um, counsel the patient regarding the possible uh, a growth uh, disturbance that can occur in the future and explain that uh, longer follow-up is uh, required. So the younger the child, uh, the more cartilage there is around the joints. Uh, therefore, the diagnosis is uh, usually more difficult uh, to make. Uh, sometimes uh, you may need to get an X-ray of the normal side uh, for comparison um, uh, because of this difficulty in diagnosis. As we said, the type 5 injuries are difficult to diagnose and, some, and sometimes you have to diagnose them uh, retrospectively uh, when you uh, see a patient with the growth arrest. So regarding treatment, you do not need to know the treatment uh, details. Uh, but basically, uh, undisplaced uh, fractures can be immobilized uh, in a cast. Uh, the healing time depends on age uh, and on the area affected. Um, generally speaking, uh, it takes between three to six weeks uh, for fractures uh, to heal. Uh, in case of uh, displaced fractures, uh, you will need to reduce the fracture and then immobilize it and to reduce the fracture this can be done in the emergency room uh, under uh, sedation for example uh, and then uh, a cast can be applied if the reduction is good um, if you do a reduction in the emergency room you will have to check with a second x-ray to make sure that the fracture is reduced uh, very commonly in children however you will need to do this reduction under general anesthetic and uh, then stabilize the fracture. Uh, this can be done either by a cast and sometimes using uh, some uh, metal work like wires or plates or screws, etc. So as we said earlier, any fracture that can affect the growth plate uh, can lead to uh, a growth uh, disturbances. Uh, now these disturbances can vary in their nature. So if you can, if you get a complete growth arrest of the whole of the growth plate, then uh, this will cause slower growth on the affected side and you will end up with the leg uh, length discrepancy, uh, i.e. the affected uh, limb will be shorter than the other side uh, with time. Uh, if you get a uh, growth arrest on only one side of the growth plate uh, and the other side is intact then this will lead to deformity uh, of the affected limb. Uh, for example if you uh, get a distal uh, femur uh, fracture through the growth plate on the lateral side uh, you can get uh, lateral growth arrest and the medial side of the growth plate will continue to grow uh, and that will lead to a valgus uh, deformity of the distal femur. Uh, now there are a few points to uh, know uh, regarding uh, this topic because uh, there are few factors that can affect the final uh, deformity. Uh, first thing is the age. Uh, the younger the child with a growth arrest, the bigger the potential for deformity. Uh, the reason behind that is that uh, boys generally grow until the age of 16 and uh, females grow until the age of 14. Uh, and if a patient, a child who is four years of, of age gets 
a fracture through the growth plate with the growth arrest. Uh, this will cause a bigger problem than a child who is 12 years of age, for example, because there are uh, more years left of growth. Uh, also, uh, the site of the uh, injury is very important. Uh, different growth plates grow at uh, different rates. In the lower limb, which is uh, the most important, uh, most of the growth happens in the distal femoral growth plate uh, with an average of 9 millimeters of growth per year. The proximal tibia uh, grows on average 6 millimeters per year and the distal tibia grows about 4 to 5 millimeters per year and the proximal femur grows 3 to 4 millimeters uh, per year. So this helps us in calculating uh, the potential uh, leg length discrepancy, for example, in cases of uh, injuries. So the information that you need are the age, the gender of the patient, uh, and the site uh, of the injury. Now, uh, sometimes you get a complete growth arrest, uh, and sometimes you can, you can get a partial uh, growth arrest, uh, which means uh, that the growth becomes slower. It does not stop completely, but it becomes slower through that affected uh, growth plate. Um, uh, also, uh, if you get a deformity uh, because of uh, an injury to one side uh, of the uh, because of only uh, one side of the growth plate uh, is affected, uh, the age is very important here. Because if you get that at a very young age, that means that the deformity will continue to uh, become worse uh, for longer pe period of time. However, if you can, if you get it, uh, for example, at 15 years of age in a male patient, then the potential for that uh, deformity is minimal because there is only one year left of growth. So these factors are very important and uh, you will need to know these details because this is the most important part of uh, growth plate injuries, uh, which are the uh, common complications. So, uh, this is a type 4 fracture of the distal tibia uh, with displacement. You can see that uh, the fracture was treated surgically uh, because the initial position was not acceptable uh, as this fracture has a higher potential for growth arrest and also uh, there was a step in the articular surface uh, because it is an intra-articular fracture. So the fracture was reduced and fixed with two screws. This is another injury of the uh, distal uh, tibia. Uh, this time it is a type 3 fracture uh, with again with a step in the articular surface and displacement. Uh, this uh, was not uh, fixed and was, was not reduced uh, and uh, this has caused uh, a growth arrest uh, of the medial side uh, of the uh, distal tibial uh, growth plate uh, as you can see on the right uh, hand uh, picture you can see that the growth plate is visible on the lateral side uh, but it's not visible on the medial side because the epiphysis has fused with the metaphysis uh, this uh, can lead to an asymmetrical growth of the distal tibia. Uh, so the lateral part will grow, will grow uh, and the fibula will also continue to grow. Uh, this will lead to a various deformity uh, of the distal tibia, which can cause uh, problems with walking. Uh, now we will move to specific fractures that can uh, affect uh, children. Clavicle fractures are very common in children. Uh, you will need to know the details in, the, in these slides, but uh, regarding uh, treatment, 99% uh, of these fractures uh, are managed conservatively uh, without uh, any surgery, uh, as they have a great healing and remodeling potential uh, in children. Uh, this is different from clavicle fractures in adults, which uh, can sometimes require surgery. In the pediatric age group, uh, the only indications for surgery uh, are the associated soft tissue injuries around the fracture, like for example, 
uh, open uh, uh, fractures. Uh, but as I said before, most cases do not require surgery in children. For example, this fracture is uh, completely displaced, uh, but the treatment is also conservative uh, if uh, there is no open fracture and uh, no neurovascular injuries. Conservative management in children uh, will heal the fracture and uh, remodeling will happen and there will not be any long-term consequences. Now we will speak about fractures of distal humerus in children, uh, which are very, very important fractures uh, and uh, they need special uh, attention and special care. Um, first of all, the diagnosis with these fractures can be sometimes difficult. Uh, the reason is, as we uh, already um, spoke about uh, the joints are cartilaginous and uh, fractures will not show easily on the x-rays. So the clinical uh, history and examination are vital in these injuries. So normally in a child uh, at birth, if you get an x-ray of the elbow, uh, there, there will be a big gap between the humerus and the forearm bones uh, because the area is totally cartilaginous. Uh, with time, uh, different ossification centers will start to appear. Uh, like if you look at the X-ray uh, provided, uh, you can see the ossification center of the capitulum, uh, which looks separate from the distal humerus. You can also see the ossification center of the radial head, uh, which is again uh, so it, looks, it looks separate from the radial shaft. Uh, if you look at the lateral elbow x-rays, there is a rounded small structure at the back of the distal humerus. This is the ossification center of the medial epicondyle, uh, which again looks separate from the rest of the bone. These ossification centers, they appear uh, in a certain sequence, and uh, you are not required the uh, you are not required to know the sequence uh, of these uh, bones, but uh, these can be confusing when you look at an X-ray, uh, and uh, they can be confused with fractures sometimes. Uh, so um, you will need to know these uh, six ossification centers uh, and their locations, so that when you see one of them, uh, you do not confuse it with uh, a fracture. Uh, now we will start with supracondylar fractures. Uh, these are the most common among uh, distal humerus fractures in children. They are caused, uh, generally speaking, by falling on the outstretched hand, uh, cause, causing a posterior force on the uh, distal humerus. Uh, they are called supracondylar fractures because they are superior to both condyles, uh, the medial and lateral condyles and though they occur in the region of the olecranon fossa of, of the distal humerus, which is a weak uh, spot in the humerus. Uh, these fractures can be displaced or undisplaced. Uh, now, displaced fractures generally heal well and do not require surgery and are not associated with any neurovascular injuries. Uh, they can be managed conservatively with uh, above elbow Casting. However, sometimes the fracture is displaced, uh, and this displacement uh, can uh, cause injuries to the surrounding neurovascular structures. Uh, the most common uh, injuries associated uh, with this fracture are injuries to the brachial artery, which can cause ischemia uh, in the hand, and also injuries to the median nerve, particular, particularly to the anterior interosseous nerve, uh, which is a branch of the median 
uh, nerve. Most of these fractures are displaced posteriorly uh, and we call them uh, extension type uh, fractures. Only 5% uh, are anteriorly displaced. As you can see, as you can see in this slide, there are two types. The extension type with posterior displacement uh, accounts for 95% of cases and the flexion type is only 5% of cases. Before, the anterior interosseous nerve uh, is at the highest risk uh, with the extension type fractures. To assess uh, this nerve, uh, you ask the child to do what we call the OK sign. Uh, it, he, he or she need to do a complete full circle. Uh, and if they can do it, that means that the anterior interosseous nerve is intact. If they cannot do it, or if you can open it easily with your fingers, uh, or if it's not a complete circle, then this can suggest an injury to the anterior interosseous nerve. As you know, the anterior interosseous uh, uh, nerve provides the nerve supply to the flexor pollicis longus muscle, the FPL, which is responsible for flexion of the interphalangeal joint of the thumb and also it provides the nerve supply to the flexor digitorum uh, profundus uh, muscle of the index and middle fingers uh, which is responsible for flexion of the DIP or the distal interphalangeal joint uh, of the index and the middle fingers. So you can either ask the patient uh, to do flexion uh, of the named uh, joints that we just mentioned or in a very small child to you ask them to do the OK sign. So diagnosis is by uh, clinical examination first, uh, history and examination. Uh, the characteristic feature is swelling. So if there is swelling, you will need to suspect a serious injury even if you do not see anything on the x-ray. Uh, limitation in the range of movements due to pain and sometimes uh, you can see uh, what we call the Tucker sign uh, which is caused by displaced fractures where uh, a bony spike is pushing against the skin and you, you can see tenting or puckering of the skin. All of these are signs of fractures. On the x-ray, you see the fracture line with or without displacement. Uh, in very subtle injuries and in minor injuries, uh, sometimes you do not see the fracture line, but you will have to look uh, at what we call the fat pad signs, uh, which are signs of uh, fractures. Uh, they, there are two signs, the posterior fat pad sign and the anterior uh, fat pad uh, sign uh, which are uh, which mean elevation of the capsule of the elbow joint uh, by intraarticular fluid uh, in this case the fluid will be blood because of the fracture uh, this fluid will push the capsule uh, anteriorly and posteriorly and this will show on the x-ray if you see this sign with uh, clinical signs of fractures uh, then you will need to treat the patient as a fracture, even if you do not see the fracture line. Once you diagnose a supracondylar fracture, you will need to decide whether this fracture is displaced or undisplaced, because this will guide your treatment. To do so, uh, first of all, on the lateral x-ray, uh, we draw what we call the anterior humeral line, uh, which is a line that we draw along the anterior cortex of the humerus. And when you extend this line distally, uh, this line should cross the middle third of the capitellum. If there is a posterior displacement, as with uh, extension type injuries, which are the most common, most of the capitellum will be posterior to this line, and therefore the line will cross uh, 
through the anterior third of the capitulum or anterior to the capitulum completely. And that indicates displacement and a possible need for surgery. This shows you how an extension type uh, fracture with displacement can cause the capitulum to be sitting behind the anterior humeral line. This is a lateral elbow uh, x-ray. Uh, the x-ray is not showing any obvious fractures. However, the fat, pines, the fat pad signs are both uh, positive uh, anteriorly and posteriorly. So this finding together with pain, tenderness, and swelling uh, indicate the presence of fracture and therefore uh, a cast needs to be applied. These are the possible complications of supracondylar fractures. As we said before, neurovascular injuries can happen uh, with injuries to the brachial artery uh, and injuries to the nerves. Any nerve can be affected here, but the most common is the anterior interosseous nerve. But when you assess the child clinically, you need to check for all the nerves, including the radial and the ulnar nerves as well. Compartment syndrome can happen, especially with severe displacement and severe swelling. Malunion is common with the supracondylar uh, injuries. Uh, medial displacement of the distal fragment can happen, uh, and if not recognized and treated, this fracture will heal in this position, leading to what we call cubitus varus deformity. Cubitus varus deformity means medial deviation of the distal fragment in relation to the proximal fragment. This is the most common deformity uh, secondary to malunion of uh, supracondylar uh, fractures. Uh, this deformity has poor remodeling potential and if it happens, it can require a super, supracondylar osteotomy uh, to correct it. Elbow stiffness can happen, uh, but uh, stiffness, uh, generally speaking, is rare in children. Uh, these photos show uh, the cubitus varus deformity of the right uh, elbow caused by malunion uh, of the uh, supracondylar fracture. Uh, when the child raises his uh, arms to the side, uh, it causes what we call the gun stock uh, deformity. Uh, on the x-ray, you can see the varus alignment uh, of the elbow joint. The second fracture that we are going to talk about today uh, is lateral condyle fractures of the elbow, uh, which is uh, the second most common fracture around the elbow in children. Uh, this fracture is uh, very important uh, the reason is uh, it can easily be missed uh, in the emergency room and uh, it has uh, long-term consequences if not treated. As you can see in the diagram below, uh, most of the distal humerus is cartilage uh, and the fracture line runs through the bone and the cartilage. Uh, as you can see from the diagrams, the fractured uh, bony fragment is large, but, but we can only see uh, the bony part of it. So when you look at the x-ray, you assume that this is a small fracture, but in fact it is a huge fragment involving nearly half of the uh, joint surface, uh, and uh, it is very often underestimated. Uh, this fracture rarely affects the neurovascular structures uh, around it, but the fracture on its own uh, can cause problems sometimes. If you look at the x-ray uh, on the right-hand side, you can see a fracture line uh, indicated by the yellow arrows uh, with a small bony fragment underneath. So this uh, can be mistaken for a minor or a small fracture. But as I said earlier, this is a huge uh, 
fragment uh, that is uh, fractured. The principles of treatment of this fracture uh, are similar to any other fractures. Uh, if the uh, fracture is undisplaced, uh, then conservative treatment can be uh, used uh, and uh, cast applied. However, if there is a, even a very small uh, uh, displacement, then uh, this fracture needs to be reduced because it is an intraarticular fracture uh, and displacement uh, in these fractures uh, is not tolerated. Uh, and uh, sometimes we will need to fix these fractures with wires or screws. Um, the problem with this fracture that uh, uh, it can cause non-union, so uh, which is a complication that we do not see with supracondylar fractures, uh, for example. Uh, the reason for non-union is that uh, the blood supply to this fragment is uh, slightly poor, and also uh, being an intraarticular fracture the synovial fluid can run through the fracture site, uh, preventing bony healing. Uh, also, malunion can happen uh, with this fracture. Uh, the most common uh, malunion is cubitus valgus, uh, as compared to the cubitus verus that can occur after supracondylar uh, fractures. This cubitus valgus uh, deformity secondary to uh, malunited lateral condyle fracture uh, can lead to ulnar nerve uh, palsy sometimes. If the fragment uh, broken is big, this can lead to instability of the elbow joint and uh, uh, dislocation. Also, because this fracture line uh, runs through the growth plate, uh, it can cause uh, growth arrest uh, similar to what we talked about uh, at the beginning uh, of this presentation. This is an example of a displaced uh, lateral condyle fracture. Uh, this is very obvious on the x-ray uh, and uh, in this case uh, it was reduced surgically and fixed uh, with K-wires uh, as you can see. The third fracture we are going to talk about is the medial epicondyle fracture. There is nothing much that you need to know about this fracture. Uh, it affects uh, an older age group, usually adolescents. Uh, basically, if the fragment is minimally displaced, it is treated conservatively. Uh, if it is significantly displaced, uh, then it needs reduction and uh, fixing. Uh, the most important point is that this fracture is commonly associated with dislocation of the elbow joint. The fourth topic we will discuss is what we call pulled elbow. Uh, this is common in young age groups up to the age of five. Um, it is usually caused by pulling uh, the hand of the child um, and this can cause the annular ligament uh, which surrounds the radial head to move and interpose uh, in the radiocapitular uh, joint uh, causing pain and limitations, uh, limitation of movements uh, of the elbow joints. Uh, clinically, there will be no swelling at all and if, if you get an x-ray, which is not necessary, but if you get it, uh, it will be completely uh, normal. Uh, generally speaking, uh, the parents will tell you that uh, uh, the child was held by the hand uh, and then he was pulled uh, or uh, sometimes it's the other way around so the child um, uh, pushes himself uh, to the floor so that causes the same pulling uh, mechanism of the elbow uh, and then the pain starts after that. Uh, the treatment for this is simple. Uh, there is a special maneuver uh, that can be done for the child uh, in the emergency room or in the clinic, and usually uh, the pain disappears immediately uh, and the movements will be restored completely uh, within a few minutes.
need to know the details of these uh, reduction maneuvers, but you will need to know that uh, the maneuver is required so that you can defer uh, the patient to the orthopedic team. Now, sometimes you will come across uh, uh, a child uh, that uh, gets easily fractured, uh, fractured or presents with uh, multiple fractures or recurrent fractures. Uh, always think about the possibility of uh, pathological fractures uh, due to an undergo uh, underlying uh, pathology. Uh, for example, osteogenesis imperfecta, uh, rickets, uh, metabolic bone disease, uh, etc. All of these uh, pathologies can cause uh, recurrent fractures. Obviously, you will always need to think about uh, non-accidental injury. Uh, this is the new name for this. Uh, we do not call it child abuse anymore. It is called NAI or non-accidental injuries. Uh, and you have to suspect uh, this uh, when you see multiple fractures, uh, recurrent fractures, uh, especially uh, if uh, the fractures at, uh, are at different levels of healing. Uh, for example, you have a new fracture on uh, one limb and a healed fracture on another limb. Uh, also, you will have to uh, be aware of uh, unclear history or mismatching history uh, from parents. Um, and then you will need to look at other uh, injuries can, that can direct you towards possible uh, non-accidental injuries uh, like uh, skin, cig cigarette burns, uh, bruising, uh, abdominal injuries, uh, intracranial hemorrhage, for example, uh, delay in seeking treatment, uh, etc. All of these are important uh, points to look for when you suspect uh, these injuries. There are some specific uh, uh, fractures uh, that are unusual in the pediatric age group unless uh, there is uh, non-accidental uh, injuries like uh, rib fractures and skull fractures. Also, what we call corner fractures uh, around the joints, uh, which are usually caused by rotational forces. These are very commonly associated with non-accidental injuries. Uh, also, uh, sustaining a femur shaft fracture in the non-walking age, uh, especially under the age of one, is highly suspicious of uh, non-accidental uh, injuries. Uh, also, humeral shaft fractures in uh, young uh, children under three uh, are also suggestive uh, of NAI. So please be aware uh, of these injuries uh, and you need to know that you are legally responsible uh, for uh, detecting uh, these injuries and for reporting it. Uh, if you suspect uh, such an injury, uh, if you are on call uh, or in the emergency room, uh, be uh, very careful uh, and uh, do not send the patient home at all. Uh, and get the, uh, uh, the in-charge team uh, involved uh, very early. Uh, in many hospitals, there is a, uh, a family protection uh, representative uh, that can deal with uh, these uh, cases. Uh, and in other places, uh, the pediatric uh, team uh, are in uh, charge of dealing with these cases. So get them involved uh, early and let them take over the case. Uh, very often, uh, this child with suspected NAI uh, will be admitted to the hospital uh, to uh, continue uh, with investigations uh, trying to protect uh, the child. Now, this is the end of our uh, talk today. Uh, if you have any questions uh, or if you need any explanations, uh, 
uh, we can have a chat about them uh, during the clinical sessions.